Coming up, a Sad Styles production. Hello and welcome. This is Mikey Aaronworth signing on to the sign off. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we did it. We made it through one episode and uh, boy, uh, what a first episode it was. We got to sit down with Daryl Sittler and go in depth. And you know, as we mentioned on the last episode, not every single show is going to have a guest on it. And that's by choice. We know that there are stories that we want to tell near and dear to our hearts. And there's no better person to do that than daddy himself. Brian Aaronworth. So this week I sit down with him and get to know how he set himself on this path to become what he would call a mogul in the world of sports marketing. This story is going to take us all over the place and it's not just going to be in the world of sports, but we wanted to highlight that to show you just how many things had to fall in place for a company to find themselves in this world. Because frankly, it was a world at that point that didn't exist. So without further ado, let's get to our next segment. Let's sit down with Brian Aaronworth, the president of Frameworth Sports Marketing, and figure out how this industry was built. We'll see you on the other side. All right, and welcome back. Uh, Thankfully, the sound of my own voice from the intro has stopped, and what will begin now is a conversation between me and a man who once again is very near and dear to my heart uh it is brian aaronworth you know him and love him as daddy or maybe that's uh, how i know you you shake your head as though you don't like me saying that no i don't you don't like me calling you that okay Okay. that's fine i'll I'll stick to mommy uh brian brian aaronworth then let's call you that uh this is a, a conversation i've been very excited to have for quite a while um as we talked about a little bit in our first episode which first of all if you're a listener and you've been uh, giving us some attention there thanks for all the love and support that we're that we're getting hopefully you're enjoying the video aspect to it uh let us know where you're subscribing and always let us know at sign off pod at framework.com if you have any questions or topics you want us to go over uh but dad i have to start this off probably the most generic question i could ever ask And I want to do this because it's sort of a broad reaching question that's going to allow you to go in a bunch of different directions. So bear with me and and bear with my fantastic interview skills as I ask you this. But Brian Aaronworth, how did you get started in the world of sports marketing? You know, that's a that's actually is one of the most frequently asked questions when I start talking about the business that I'm in. Mm, That that's what a good interviewer likes to hear. Oh, I've heard that question quite a few times. Well, you know, from the average person that comes in, a customer or somebody that, a friend, uh, somebody that I've just met, and, and they'll they'll ask me what, what I do for a living, and I tell them sports marketing, and they want to elaborate on that, and then I talk about framing memorabilia and working with players, et, et cetera, and they'll say, well, how did you ever get into a business like that? You know, they're obviously fascinated with the fact that, that I have associations with a, a number of athletes, um, Sidney Crosby and Daryl Sittler, as we discussed last week and and interviewed him. And so basically they want to know how do you ever get into something like that? And, and it it was kind of fluky. If I had to write a book, I'd call it fortuitous. It just, Mm. things just seem to happen. So you're going with like that Clint Eastwood style title, just (laughs) one word, right? Just one word. And then you're going to be the uh, angry grizzled old man. That's just recounting his story. I'm not going to be, I am. (laughs) Okay. Fair, fair. Okay. So what, what ends up happening is we, out of the, my dad sold his company and, um, I, now, what, was, what was that company? Because we're I want to start in the beginning because okay. you weren't always in this world, right? This is one thing that I know about you is Frameworth was not always a sports marketing company, right? No. In fact, I worked for my dad's company, which was Who called- does that? Who works for their dad? That's just <laughs> nepotism. Are you kidding me? I worked for Frame Guild, which was a, a wholesale picture frame company that did wholesale picture framing for art galleries, for interior designers, et cetera. That's what I grew up. Uh, when I left school, I, I started working as a salesman for him. And um, it just turned out that, you know, I, as, as it's difficult for a son to work for a father, as you know, um, I just didn't feel as a young kid I was getting the respect. So I went off and opened a, a bar, actually, which right. was every young guy's dream to open their <laughs> own bar. And you were how old? Uh, 23. 23. And keep in mind, listener, we're all, we're saying this to show you just how fortuitous it was that you ended up in this world the the trajectory that you started at 23 did not necessarily 
uh, peg you as someone who is going to be working in this world of sports marketing and telling your stories? Not at all. Um, I opened a bar because I liked hanging out in bars and, and doing the bar scene. Uh, I opened a picture frame company that led me into the sports marketing thing. So it's really what you'll want to do. I was a big sports fan. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I opened the bar, that worked out very well. Um, bar business is a tough business to to work. And uh, Yeah, you th- tell us that all the time. Yeah. yeah. All the kids, you say, it's amazing we succeeded, but we did because of my smart thinking and ingenuity. Yeah. <laughs> and so we moved on to, uh, so I moved back to my dad's company. When he sold that company, I opened this company as basically the same thing. I uh, took some of the old accounts. Uh, I didn't have a non-competition with them, so I could do what I want. I took on uh, a few accounts in, in Yorkville to do the art gallery scene. And then one of the bigger accounts that we took over was the was the record business for right. the Canadian record industry. It was called uh, Korea. Korea. And we used to frame uh, the gold records for all the big stars back then when there was record albums sure. and you would do the platinum album and the gold album. And when a big star came to town and they wanted to give the platinum award, we would frame it and have it sent down to them along with 20 other copies that the record companies would give out to executives. And that right. those, those all the background that you would see uh, hanging on the walls and movie sets for, for, for those. Now, now at, at this point, had you had any experience in the world of sports market? Have you worked with any athletes? Because on the last episode, we talked about how your first interaction really with an athlete to sell sports memorabilia, which was ultimately the pioneer move for framed and signed sports memorabilia. It was with Daryl Sittler and Borier Salming. Was that with the past company or, or with this one that you started? No, actually the past company, Frame Guild, did that, those two pieces, but then it kind of fell off the map. We didn't do anything with it. The closest I got to any kind of memorabilia was the gold records. When we did open this company, the bigger accounts, and it wasn't that big, we were doing maybe $600,000 in year one. Right. Or, you know, around there. Uh, in in total sales, so it was just me and a couple of other people that started this company. So so I want to ask you a question about that though, because from what we talked about in the last episode, um, and for those of you who who may not have heard it, essentially with the company, uh, Daryl Sittler and Borier Salming had a a a piece which was uh, drawn like an artist. Do you remember the name yep. of the artist? Uh, uh, Mervin Sobel had had created this piece, and you guys had framed it and gotten it signed not only by the artist, which was commonplace back then, to sign the prints to sort of give them more legitimacy and authenticity and value, but now also the athletes came in and did the same thing. And you had said that that was quite a success, correct? It was a big success, but it it in the sense that uh, it was new and it was innovated, innovative, but it, it didn't really take off as mainstream. So at that point, was there not a thought, because you know you mentioned you loved alcohol, so you opened a bar, right? You loved sports, so you got into sports marketing, but there was something there early on where you could have gotten a bit more involved with sports. Was there a reason why you strayed away from it? Um, one, I didn't know how to market that stuff back then. It wasn't mainstream. There wasn't really anything there, so I stuck to what I knew, right. which was picture framing. But I did start tying that into the sports world. So the sure. athletes and, and doing autograph memorabilia didn't come along for years. Right. Um, what did come along in 1992, if you recall, which you would be very young at that age. I, I remember. So I was born in, uh, for all you ladies out there listening, I was born in 1989. I'm a there cool 32 years old. And I remember 1992. There was a day that year that you and my brother Chris woke me up from an afternoon nap to tell me some news about something. What do you remember? What that was? I was in a I was in a uh, a dream filled with milk and cookies or some oh. whatever kids dream about. What was it that you woke me up to tell me? Was that the Blue Jays winning? Oh, did that happen in 1992? Is that yes, what that was? Yes, oh, okay, yeah. yeah, 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 something like that. And I went immediately back to sleep. I was not of the age where I understood <laughs> what that meant. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, again. Uh, and we'll bring this up. I'm, I'll use this word on uh, a number of occasions moving forward, but fortuitous. Okay. We started the business in 1992. I think that was the year that the fan radio started their sports talk show in 1992 at the same time. Interesting. The Blue Jays were on fire. Uh, I used to go to every game uh, pretty much at least one, at least one game a series anyway. Okay. And then... If you recall in 1992, Doug Gilmore came to Toronto mm-hmm. and the team just turned around after all those years of, you know, some good teams with Daryl Sittler on it. But really, again, we're still waiting. 
but in 1967. The <laughs> there was Blue, some hope. There was some hope at that point. The Blue Jays were on fire. The Leafs were hot as a pistol. Doug Gilmore changed everything, and we hope to get Doug on the show at some point moving forward to talk about those things. Sure. Uh, but in 1992, uh, when Framework started, I remember the when the Blue Jays won, I took a uh, piece, being a sports fan and being in the framing business, I designed a piece for myself. And it involved taking the team set of upper deck cards and framing them around a signed program that I remember getting from uh, Dwayne Ward, mm-hmm. uh, the stopper. So so I'm just putting a few things together. Um, I think the listener will be able to, uh, to follow me on this one. You got into the bar industry because you like drinking. You got into the sports marketing world because you like sports. And the only reason you created this piece was just to have something personal in your collection. So you know what? Do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. How about that? Exactly. Now, this piece that I did for myself at the time, very selfish. only doing um, $600,000 in business to this point, uh, I did do a little bit of custom framing work for, for my friends over at Labatt's. Mm-hmm. I, I used to golf with uh, one of the marketing managers, Walt Lemon, and to this day, I owe him so much um, because he, he helped my small little business going by sending over some wall decor for Labatt's or a few things that they needed framed. So... I took the same piece that I did for myself, and if you, many of you, uh, our listeners will um, remember that Labatt's was a big part of that Blue Jay team. Right. I think they still are, um, and part owner, I believe. So I took the piece that I did for myself and sent one over to Walt as a gift. And within about 15 minutes of him receiving that, I got a phone call, and he said, Brian, he says, this is amazing. Thanks so much. How much is that piece? And I remember the exact price. I said, but I said, Walt, this is this is not um, something I'm going to charge you for. It's a gift to thank you for the business that you send me. And I guess Labatt's was one of my biggest accounts. Probably did about twenty five thousand dollars a year in custom framing. Mm-hmm. And he phoned me back, and and so and I said, no, it's a gift. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. Thank you for the gift, but there's other people in the office that want it. And I said well, geez, okay, I'll figure out a price. And I gave him a real good price. I remember thinking, well, they're probably it's probably worth about $350. It's all hand cut. Right. And I said, you know what? I'm going to give you a volume price just to see what we can do. And I remember the price. It was $185 wholesale. Okay. Remind I, us again what was in that frame. I had to have the upper deck a series of uh, team set of cards, which there weren't that many out there. I had to go collect them and go to uh, card dealers. You and, you went out and bought the decks of cards to right, fill this order. Right. Now, I, and this is, so here's, here's another kind of, uh, I, I hesitate to say inside baseball, but we are dealing with baseball a little bit. Nowadays, the technology has changed to a point where we have machines that will do the cutouts for us. Yes. If you have 30 cards in a machine, in, in a mat, you can do that all by machine, but you were doing this by hand as well. Right. This is very, this is almost Bezos in his garage type stuff where you're just taking the order, figuring out a way to make it sell. The, the, I, the image of you going store to store, finding out, finding individual cards is amazing. And I remember at certain points having worked here where we've committed to an order that maybe requires like a magazine cover or something and our contacts at Sports Illustrated couldn't get us enough. So we would go location to location, convenience store to convenience store and try to find find as many to fill the order. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I didn't actually, eventually I found different um, sports card dealers that would would accumulate the cards and give me a team set. Sure. So they might sell me five here and another store might sell me 10 there. But before that even happened, I was just looking for a few extra sets for the people at Labatt's that wanted them. Was was there at that time a company that could have collected these? Was was Upper Deck even selling them as sets? Not as or team sets to, back then, I, I don't I mean, think. it's so it's funny how the, the, the industry has changed in terms of availability. There, there's parallels you can draw to probably just about any other industry, but how much more difficult it would have been to like, for example, if you're if you're getting out there on YouTube right now and you want to distribute some of your or your music, now you have SoundCloud, now you have Spotify, you can get out there relatively easily. Whereas back in the day, there was a lot more grassroots. You just had to find a way to make it work. So you didn't have the resources like a company that's going to compile all these team sets and you just buy them. Nowadays, you can go to a company like Grosner and buy a team set of cards, which is great for us because the memorabilia industry has demanded it. But right. back then, it didn't exist. Right. Right. So who knows? Maybe we triggered that. I don't know. Keep in mind, we're starting in 1992. I don't even think I had a computer back then. 
Uh, you barely have a computer. You have a lot of computers, but whether <laughs> well, it wasn't you for you, them, I wouldn't I don't have know. Them. Yeah. But anyway, so now I go back and I collect all these cards and I make up a few sets and I send over, I guess Walt ordered another five sets for the people around the office and he was in charge of the sales team. So the sales team then started showing them to the bars and restaurants that they uh, handled and this, and and they realized that the bars and restaurants wanted them to hang in the bars and restaurants, and all of a sudden those five turned into ten, turned into twenty, and by the time Christmas rolled around, keep in mind that they won in uh, Mr. O- October, mm-hmm. right? so uh, they by the time Christmas rolled around, they for a company doing six hundred thousand total in sale, they had ordered two hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of that one product. <sighs> Jesus. Fortuitous. Fortuitous indeed. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's, that's uh, a growth of almost an entire 50% just right. over the course of, this is the one item basically. Right. That they one item. Of. And that just got me thinking, okay, what else can sell my picture frames? Because people back then, when we were dealing with an interior designer, they'd come in to frame a family photo. Right. Right. And the family photo might cost $75 to frame. Right. And they'd complain that the price was too expensive and how can you charge $75 for that? But if you put in an autographed photo of Doug Gilmore for $15 right. and charged $150, people would go, wow, what a steal. What a great deal. What exactly. a great deal. And that's when I started, the, the light bulb went on and I went, wait, wait, this is waiting for an interior designer to come and spend an hour in the showroom to frame a piece for, for, uh, for $150 when I can sell... $250,000 worth of product uh, on one item. And, and was this one item, did that have Labatt's branding on it? We, uh, I think we put it on the brass plate. Right. Which was a whole other thing because so this, we didn't have a machine to do bla- brass plates. For sure. So that's another, I mean, nowadays we have a machine that can do just about every element of this. And most people in the framing world do, right? But one, what I want to kind of stress here is the fact that nowadays, if you walk into a bar, all across the bar are branded frames that have something to do with like a Labatt's collection of Stanley Cups or something that they've done. But that was all sort of started with this. They, they the, never had, I mean, the sports bars back then might hang a jersey on a hanger or, you know, just put it cheaply in a frame. There right. was none of this. Um, Looked like a first year university student's bedroom. Exactly. Yeah. Sec, you know, tack posters on or yeah. put uh, beer signs with the neon signs. That was the way you Still did Still a first year university student's bedroom. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. But, you know, it's interesting, too, because we weren't prepared for this kind of business. Keep in mind that I don't, maybe there was 25 little square openings to put the cards that we had to cut out of the mats. We had three people in the plant. I remember when we started getting these orders, he said, well, we need these for Christmas. Can you get them to us? And I said, yes. Right. Had no idea how we were going to do it. And literally me and a few other guys would come in. I was actually back in the plant cutting mat board openings to make sure that we hit that deal and, and got them on time. Yeah. And now, so so from, from this moment, though, you mentioned that a light bulb kind of went off. Was it at that moment that you knew, like from, from the Labatt's deal on, you knew that sports marketing was a thing? Because there's a lot of steps between where we are and where that, that started as, right? Absolutely. And, and again, I, I want to stress to the listener that this is an example of, of how it happened for Frameworth. But this isn't necessarily a Frameworth podcast. This is just to kind of show that a lot of companies do sort of find their way into this world through something being fortuitous or or a little bit of happenstance, and and we're no different. Um, but the idea of autographs, because that is a large portion of, of what we do, what a lot of sports memorabilia consists of now, was that even at that time on your radar? Or, well, or, or what was the thing that got that going? Keep in mind that the program in the middle of this framed Blue Jay piece was an autographed, and now I had to go procure the autographs from player, uh, players on the team. And, right. and that was difficult because I had no contacts back then for players. So I had to find somebody. I think even, I can't even recall how we got those autographs. might have been somebody at Labatt saying, well, I can get them autographed for you. We'd prefer to have the, the program autograph. So we did that. Um, but autographs soon became uh it became clear to me that that they were going to start selling the frames what, as well. what was that what what cued you onto that um well just as i i mentioned before that if if our job was to sell custom picture framing sure and if an autograph helped to sell that which it obviously did with this labat piece right then and it wasn't just the autograph it was the whole look and right, feel the presentation of it. You know, overall, it was yeah. wall decor that was 
pretty sexy looking yeah. uh, for the sports fan. Sure. So the autographs themselves helped to, to sell the framing. So we were completely opposite from a company like Upper Deck. Upper Deck would get the autographs and sell those, and maybe people would frame them, maybe they would, and they'd put them in a drawer. We started in the framing world. Right. And we took the autographs to help sell the, the picture framing. Yeah. And that was the beginning of, of the whole man cave thing, the, the, the boardroom frame jerseys. Sure. Nobody did that yeah. back then. And, and nowadays, Upper Deck is doing those sorts of things. Do you think that Frameworth as an entity would have had an influence on where these other... I mean, it's safe to say larger companies have now ended up. How much of an influence do you think Frameworth had on that? Uh, a huge influence. Yeah. I mean, they may argue with me, but I don't think they even had a framing department back then. Mm -hmm. um, I know Steiner, which is another huge company in the U.S., uh, might have been bought out by Fanatics. Um, Fanatics, all these companies started uh, with memorabilia, but evolved into the picture framing. We did right. it opposite, and I think we were at the forefront of creating... Um, that framed wall decor that uh, is so prominent around the industry right now. It, it definitely feels that way. And when you, uh, one thing that I w I'm a little bit curious about, and I, I know that our listeners are going to love this uh, because it, it gets into sort of the involvement that you have in the sports world. But when you started to decide to get into sports memorabilia and include signed products, who were some of the players around and, and were available? After talking to to Daryl uh, Sittler, who, how I did that, that, that is the way that someone name drops in Hollywood. I was talking to Daryl the other day, Sittler, you may have heard of him, um, and he was mentioning how, you know, he was one of the first to be involved in, especially the 10 point night. Who were some of the early athletes that you worked with? And was there a reason why they were chosen as opposed to someone else? So another thing that happened to me back in the, when I started this company being a sports fan was the one account that I really wanted to get. Be, and, and keep in mind, all I wanted to do was get their framing business, things for the offices, things for around the, the, the uh, building was Maple Leaf Gardens. Right. And Maple Leaf Gardens, I remember back in the day, I used to drive my car, go in, I made a contact with a, uh, the publicity guy. Actually, Daryl mentioned him, Stan Obodiak was yeah. the first contact I had. Really nice guy. We hit it off really well. And I'd go in just because I loved walking into that building. And if I was downtown three days a week trying to open businesses and get new business, I would always park right in front of Maple Leaf Gardens. For some reason, I never got a parking ticket. <laughs> I would just leave my car there. and I Because they knew who drove that car. No, I think it would have to do with <laughs> it, um, the police being very friendly with uh, Harold Ballard. Oh, okay. And okay. Harold Ballard controlled the police back then. I won't say <laughs> controlled them, but he had a great relationship with the police department, tickets. Yeah. Uh, they loved they loved the building. So they, they left that area. They alone, left alone. the area, and I think it was largely due because they never knew who was just dropping could, in. Could have been an athlete, could have been an owner. Could well, have been... I think also that a lot of people would park there, run in, get their tickets from the box office, which was right inside the front door. And Harold doesn't want the police deterring he, people yeah. from getting their tickets. Exactly. Ah, okay, okay. So... I kind of figured that out and I would, I would leave my car there for an hour, two hours. And I don't think in, in five years I got one ticket. <laughs> so I go up and see Stan Obodiak and, uh, and come back and pick up the odd thing that they needed framing. But one day I pulled out in front of that uh, building and, uh, and I saw, well, this actually skips ahead a lot, but I did, I, I looked across the street and there was a restaurant Oh, and this is another story we'll tell this, it another this is, this time. Is, so what, what, what's going to happen over the course of this episode, especially because we're sort of laying the groundwork is there's going to be a lot of thing. There are going to be a lot of things that we bring up and just kind of move past because it's going to be dealt with on the next episode or another episode. And I know what you're about to talk about. And that's Gardoonies. Right. Which is why don't you explain some of that? Well, so I parked the car outside, ran inside. And as I was sitting in the car, just getting ready to leave, I look across the street and there was an old restaurant, uh, a restaurant that was across the street that had gone bankrupt. And then I thought, well, okay, I'm in the framing business. I work with athletes. So I was already working with athletes at the time. But Who, who would you have been working with at this point? Uh, well, I was buying autographs from other people. Okay. From okay. people who had procured them from Right. The, the people athletes. in the, the autograph hounds, the brokers, sure. the people that were in the inside track. Sure. And so, but then I thought, now I take my restaurant background and uh -huh. I take my, my, uh, framing background and and contacts and i thought what a great restaurant that would be to open and we en ended up opening that and i'll get into that story another time 
but Doug Gilmore and Bob McCowan were partners in that at the beginning. Right. So um, wasn't wasn't just to go back a little bit the the 1992 World Series piece, there was a little bit of a connection between that and Bob McCowan as well, wasn't there? Yes, there was. That was the first time I met Bob. The and first I, time you met Bob. And I, Bob, obviously, on Fadu, which we're happy to be a part of as well. So yeah, this is, the, uh, it all well, comes full circle. We've been working with Bob, so this podcast will be part of the whole network. Yeah. Um, and we're excited to be part of that. And Bob's got, I think, the number one sports podcast in Canada. But um, we're right behind you. Yes, you better we're, watch we're, yourself, we're, McCowan. We're coming back. <laughs> so... Without being too convoluted here, we I took that Blue Jay piece to Bob, and I forget how I initially met him, but I remember dropping it off to his house, and it was a frame program. And uh, just as a gift, again, again, that was my kind of mode of operation. Real it's Trojan like, horse mentality. Exactly. Don't, don't worry about collecting in, in the short term. It'll pay dividends in the long term. And so that's the way we built the business, looking after people, um, you know, not worried about the nickels and dimes as, uh, as, uh, Eddie Shack would say. Yep. And, and you would just make, make friends that way and, and look after people and they eventually, uh, look after you. And now I've got some great friends in the industry, but memorabilia, Doug Gilmore was probably, yeah. you know, being in 1992, he was the hottest autograph to have. I yeah. think back then his jerseys and the auctions were autographed jerseys and the golf auctions and those type yeah. of things were going for eight, nine hundred dollars, which was huge. Especially back, back then. then. Right. Um, as by way of comparison, I mean a lot of the modern day players will go for less than that. Oh, exactly. Uh, and and that's that's, you know, with the market being what it is. I mean, nowadays you have uh, uh new drafted player, newly drafted players and their jerseys are going for, you know, as much as you know, a Wendell Clark or even a Doug Gilmore now without even having played much in the league. It's the, the world has changed so much and the economy has changed so much around it. I want you to take us back because you were talking about Stan Bodiak, I think yep. his name was, yep. and, and you were on your way to go see him. You saw the restaurant that would soon become Gardini's, but what was the, what, what were you going to see Stan about? Uh, just typically every, every, as mentioned, every time I was downtown, I would just want to go into the gardens. And sometimes I knew my way around that place. So people at, you know, you walk in like you own the place and you'd walk right by the guards because they'd think you're somebody important. Yeah, for those of you, for those of you who don't know my dad, he walks into every room like he owns the place <laughs> and, and gets away with quite a bit that way. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, it it goes without saying that if you look like you belong, most people will think you do belong. So I would walk by and I'd sit and watch the practice. The That's least awesome. would be practicing. We've You and I have done that before. We've been down in Pittsburgh to go do, to, do a signing with uh, Sydney or, or Gino at the time. And I remember we would just kind of wander into the practice facility. And like you said, you just walk by like you should be there and you end up watching practice like it's nothing. I wouldn't recommend it for everybody because sooner or we later... We should you... say that. We should say that. <laughs> Don't do that. I mean, this is what we're doing is showing you what you shouldn't be doing if you're going into a practice facility. We, we, we don't want... <laughs> well, keep in mind, it, it takes a little while to become a familiar face. So yes. the first time I might have said, I'm going to see Stan Obodiak, and they might have called up to see if that was okay or whatever, or Harold, Harold Ballard might have something to frame. I remember uh, Bill Clough. Uh, he used to work the hot stove. So I knew my way around the, the gardens, and it was an awesome place to be. So whenever I got bored, I'd you know, make an excuse, like, I got to go to Maple Leaf Gardens and pick up some, see if they have any framing for me to pick up. Yeah. And I would say they might at one in every four times I've been there, but I think I, I did waste a lot, not waste a lot of time, but spent a lot of time there uh, where it really wasn't about business, more about, hey, checking out the fans or che checking out the stands and the, and the practice. What's, what's your best memory from the gardens? Wow. There's just so many. We used to go every, every game to the Maple Leaf Gardens, uh, my dad had seasons tickets and he, he collected a lot of great seats. So sitting down four seats from the, from the players bench, uh, when the Leafs had that series against, um, uh, LA, LA. and Wayne Gretzky was yeah. playing and yeah. I was sitting three seats down from, from the LA bench. Now, now as a friend of Wayne Gretzky's, uh, Ooh, would I he, don't... would he like to hear what you had to say to him during that match? <laughs> no, I literally got into a, a match, a yelling match with, uh, <laughs> One of the players there, I, I forget who it was, and Kelly Rudy was in between us for some reason, and I literally was four seats away from him. And so I was talking. Was to it this the point. lower glass at this point? We're too? right on the glass. Yeah, right on the glass. And so I could reach out and touch the players, 
And Which you had to constantly be reminded not to do. Yes. This was, and this is on the ice and off the ice. It was a real problem <laughs> for my dad. And uh, no, they didn't want to sign autographs for me during the game. Yeah, either. why would they? Why would they? So the, the, he would give me a hard time. Um, and I was giving him a hard time. And then I remember Kelly Rudy stopping and saying, he's a warrior. Because I was give, griefing him about how dirty he was or something. Anyway, I remember talking to the player during the game. And like back then there was no glass behind yeah, the yeah. bench and all that stuff. So we're going back quite some time. That's now. amazing. Yep. I love that. Yeah. The, uh, so, so the, the gardens obviously had a lot, uh, you know, the, the change from the gardens to the ACC and, and this, this is kind of a, a, a theme that we're going to get into quite a bit, uh, on this podcast, but the moments of sport in which there exists an entire industry that not many people see an example would be the 1992 world series and the closing of the gardens and the shift over to the air Canada center it almost denotes a, a change in Frameworth as well, but we had a lot of involvement in that process and the memorabilia surrounding the closing of, a, of an iconic building as well. Whereas most people see, you know, we're just moving on. Let's let's say our farewells and, and we go onwards, but you don't see it that way. No, you know what? I think part of the whole thing is recognizing opportunities when they exist. So I know that um, special events like the Blue Jays open my eyes, the World Series. I almost missed the second one. Okay, because we started to take off. Business was so good. And then when they won back to back, yeah, um, it was actually Walt Lemon at Labatt that called me and said, aren't you doing another Blue Jay piece? Oh, really? I almost missed that because we were just wrapped up in the, in the Leafs sure. and everything else by that time. Would you have had a license at this point? Uh, no. So here's, here's a, a bit of clarification. Uh, I, I'm sure a lot of you know this. A lot of our listeners know this. Uh, but but I, I'm, I'm also nearly positive uh, many people don't. But if you're going to create memorabilia for uh, a league uh, or players, you need to have certain licenses in order to do it properly. We talked about this a little bit on the last episode. But what that means is you're basically giving a guarantee to the league that a portion of your sales are going to go back to them to be distributed among the people who earn a cut in there. It's an expensive proposition. Uh, not all companies in the world of sports marketing have it, and they either find ways to skirt around it or, or you know, play between the lines and in gray areas, always at risk of having their hand slapped a little bit. We always like to be as by the book as possible with this sort of thing. But you're saying that at this moment, you didn't have a license, which means you can't produce your own material based on the images. You kind of had to find what existed out there and then create frames around that. Right, and even then... Um, if you ask the leagues, they, although they didn't stop you, uh, they would have told you it didn't matter. You still had to have a license because you're taking, uh, components that were licensed right. and making a brand new product. And that's, that theory still exists today. However, the leagues are usually okay with that, but, uh, it, it's an interesting thing because this was all new territory. So the leagues did not really understand framed memorabilia sure. they they really just uh they licensed upper deck to do cards and they licensed banner people to do banners and mug people to do glass mugs right. but they didn't memorabilia was was totally different and in fact um, there was a piece that i created that somebody liked so much they sent to the nhl which was for your older brother chris uh -huh. we took a little miniature um uh maple leafs jersey yeah i framed it up with a pair of little miniature hockey gloves. Right. And his photo, I think right. we still have that piece. I, in the I've basement. seen that piece, yeah. And a photo of him as a, a young boy mm -hmm. and put a little plate underneath that said, uh, what was he, 86, 96, the year 2001, first round draft. Pick. Right. It made some kind of funny plate below right. as if he would be the first round draft pick you know, 18 years later. It's similar to those frames where it's uh, it's an image of the jersey and on the back of it, you can put your own name or right. something like that. Like that kind of idea where you're inserting yourself into the sport. Once again, I did that piece for my own purpose to mm -hmm. hang on our wall at mm -hmm. home. And it was kind of a cute thing in, in his bedroom. But somebody saw that in my office and told the NHL about it. And the NHL contacted me to see if I wanted to have a NHL license to produce pieces like that. Oh, so that's a, you know, I, I almost forgot about that story. And so we had to think about it and ask, well, what's involved with getting a license and why do we even need sure, one? Sure. Sure. So they went through the whole details of what advantages we would have in doing something like that. But keep in mind, there was no NHL player photos in that 
piece. Right. It was just a, which is a, a separate jer- license would have been the player's it's a association. separate license. Yeah. So now that we sign on to the NHL, which gave us a, the license to create images using their marks, their jerseys, their any any trademark from any team, but it didn't allow us to use a player in it. Right. So that was the second stage of, of the thing. But for a while, um, along around that time, a fellow came to me named Scott Silcox. Okay. And he had a print called the Heritage uh, Jersey Series. And what he did was he put, and I'm sure you've seen them because these have been around for years and years, and we still sell from time to time, but it was our biggest seller back then or one of them, unsigned, which was the evolution of the hockey jersey for each team. Right. So it took every jersey, every significant change to the Toronto Maple Leaf jersey, and he recreated a drawing of each one, and there might have been 13, 14 of them in that series at the time. And it was a long, narrow print, probably 12 by 24, I think it was. Um, And we framed that, and we plaqued it. Right. And we sold those en masse to the big department store chains. It was a really hot item. Yeah, I remember that. I mean, we... I. I started working here years and years and years ago, over a decade ago now, I think. But I remember even at that point in time, for the next several years, that was still an element of the items that we sold. So that that just echoed through all time. I mean, and this was before the the nostalgia of a, a heritage jersey was really a thing. I mean, it, it came at a time when it was, you know, nowadays we've got the reverse retro jerseys and, and the Adidas Classics and CCM doing their vintage jerseys when they had the license. But back then, it was still kind of niche. It may have been the first time where any everyone had seen all of the different jersey styles in in one spot. Yeah, the history of the game has always been part of of you know the whole process. The 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 thing that people love about about the game is is the history. Baseball is probably the biggest at that with with their history. But even in the hockey world back then, what was the jersey Maurice Richard was wearing? What did Ted right. Kennedy wear? How did it change over the years? Right. This captured the imagination of the fans and it took off. And we did Toronto, then we did Montreal, then we did all the teams, then we did a combination of of the original six teams yep. versus the next six and all that. So I, I mean, we're getting close to having to wrap this up, but I, I want to get into one more thing, which is kind of in that vein. And it's the idea, you know, I kind of asked Daryl about this being Sittler, you may know him, uh, being involved in sports and being an athlete himself, has it changed the way that he watches sports and hearing you talk about the ways you have to find and, and, and put your finger on the pulse in different styles of memorabilia when, when you're watching sports. How different is it for you? Are you constantly on the lookout for something new? Not just in terms of a moment that happens, because those are easy to notice, but are you always looking at, you know, the rink boards or the advertisements? Or, or, or like, is, is this more than just about watching your favorite team play a sport that you love now? Absolutely. I look at everything that's going on around the rink. I mean, I do focus on, on the game because I'm a hockey fan, but um, watching... And it doesn't just relate to hockey. I know right. you mentioned the rink board. So the, one of the biggest jobs that we ever received was uh, I saw a photo of Sidney Crosby skating by uh, the Planters Peanut right. sign. And uh, I thought you were talking about the the actual Planters Peanut. He was playing that day. Yes, he played yeah. for Philadelphia for a while. People don't know this. And he had to change from a top hat to a bucket. But <laughs> Anyway, he <laughs> old school Jofa helmet. Yeah. So Sidney Crosby was skating by that sign, and I thought, wow, what a great uh, piece of publicity. It's it's something that we were framing anyway right. as as autograph piece. But I'm thinking, wouldn't this be a great thing for planters to give to all their executives? Sure. And so I happened to look up the owner's name. I knew him through somebody else, uh, and and I got Sidney to sign something to Joe, who was the president at the time. Um, best wishes to Joe, um, and sent it to him. Mm-hmm. Same as I did with sure. Walt Lemon. This is a winning the old formula. Trojan horse mentality, right. exactly. And once again, I got a call back. This is outstanding. How many? How much are these? How many can I get? Uh, and we w- again, one of the largest orders that we've ever had for one piece was that piece, which was given out. They called dealer loaders. Okay. So in the grocery stores, if you put a certain product at the front of the building right. with a special display, the manager was thanked by giving them a nice something or other, sure. or they would use that to as a contest thing. 
and they bought hundreds and hundreds of those pieces from from me. Uh, and a very subtle advertising. There's planners in the background on the board. Sidney Crosby was the big yep. um, draw, of course, with the autographs. And um, so those are the things that you're always looking for, an opportunity like that. That's amazing. Now, has it, I mean, you mentioned that you're constantly watching sports in a slightly different way, but has it impeded your ability to enjoy sports and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you answer. Give me a quick answer because then I have a follow-up that I want to give you. <laughs> you know too much about my background. <laughs> this isn't going into the Pittsburgh game. No, that we'll get into that. <laughs> that, that. That'll be a bonus episode. The most energized I've ever seen my dad and the most uh, egregious I've ever seen him was at a, a Pittsburgh Penguins game. But uh, but we'll, we'll get into that at a later date. Um, so... The way the question was, where what do I see about the- has has it has it impeded your ability to enjoy watching sports a little bit because you're constantly thinking of not just hoping your team wins in a way that's going to allow you to to create memorabilia around it, but also just it's so much work you you spend your entire day thinking about sports and sports memorabilia. Are you able to just get home, turn on a hockey game, and enjoy it without thinking too much about it, or is that always no. going on? No way, right? It's that's it. I. But that's my nature. Um, I go to bed thinking about ideas. I, I wake up thinking about, I wake up in the middle of the night with an idea. Um, everything that I see around me, and it doesn't have to be from the hockey world. I remember sitting on the John one day reading a <laughs> magazine, and in there, there was a, a picture. Oh, I think it was a LeBaron. It was a, a, a outdoor catalog sure. about things. And there was a little kid wearing a, uh, wearing a hat, that looked like a bear's head. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's, so it looked like he was a little cub. And then that just, I said, wouldn't that be great if the hat looked like a hockey helmet? There you go. Right. Yeah. Um, that idea, we weren't in the clothing business, so it never really took off. But I think I've seen, seen things like it's, it it's from become people a in thing. a manufacturer. I, I have seen it. So that's the way my mind works. Right. Um, does it mean I don't enjoy the game? No, you You've seen me watching a playoff game with the Leafs or, or the Penguins. For and sure. You know what I'm like. Well, um, here, here's the interesting thing is you've sort of, uh, uh, for at least for live sports, you've kind of changed the way that I have to watch live sports because you never know who's around you, whether it's a player, player's family, someone you're about to do business with later. I used to always want to show up to the games in a jersey. You cautioned me that that might not be smart because who knows who you're going to see there, one of the player's parents or something along those lines. And also just... I, when we went to go see the Olympics in Vancouver, I was lucky enough to go watch uh, a Canada-Russia game and a Canada-Germany That's game. That's 2010, yeah. It's 2010 in Vancouver. And I remember I was sitting in an area where it was very possible that the people around me would have been the family of the people on the rink. And I was losing my mind. I was going absolutely bonkers. The cameras were on me because I was just, I was the one trying to rile people up. And I remember you looked at me and you're like, you got to tone it down. Like you don't know <laughs> who you're offending right now, but it may come back and bite you. And I've thought about that ever since. And it has affected my, uh, my ability to enjoy at least live sports. But uh, for, for you, I, I, I know that maybe you can put that aside. Maybe you're not as energetic and, and, and outgoing at the, at the games, but there is one situation where, where we may, we well, may have we'll to get into too. that. It's where I've lost my mind probably once since I've been in this business. But I mean, when you're in, in the games in, in Vancouver and you, we've got, um, we've got American clients and we've got yep. Canadian clients and now you got the Americans playing the Canadians and all of a sudden you one, one of the, one of the Russian players skated off uh, as, as it was clear that Canada was going to win that game. And I started chirping him so hard that <laughs> I, I feel bad because I remember the look in their faces, but a, uh, a clearly a, a, a father and a mother of one of the players turned around and looked at me and just shook their head looking so sad. And I remembered that's their kid and this is their life. And I'm just here like, I hope my team wins for my flag. It was just a different yeah, uh, different kind of experience. But that's, that's great. I love that introduction. There's a ton of stories that I want to get into a little bit more detail, which we will do over the course of the coming episodes. We're going to try to stagger a couple of these sort of behind the scenes episodes.